Okay, let's talk about something called, that I'm calling the four questions for problem solving, and specifically about the first assignment, which is due in a week uh, from today. Today's Friday, so it's due on Friday, August 30th. All right. Um, the stuff I'm talking about right now is not essential for the entire class. You could leave it out and the class would be fine. But it's one of those things that I discovered several years ago that if I spent a week or, or part of a week covering this, it turned out that people did much better in the class. So there's something about looking at this particular approach that I'm going to go through right now, which isn't essential for the final result of what you get from the class, but for some reason really made it easier for a lot of students to, to get into the right mode. So hopefully that will be the same for you. Uh, if not, just... Uh, Make sure it makes sense for this first assignment. It'll be involved in this first assignment, and then after that, you can sort of forget all this. But this is uh, this is the stuff we want to look at. What it turns out to be helpful for do, for a lot of students to do, and I didn't make all this stuff up. I put it in my own words, but it comes from some fairly standard theory about how algorithms work, um, is to identify four different questions you can ask about any algorithm. The first two are the most important for now. Those are the questions about what do you have available when you specify the algorithm. And the last two is you just want to specify to make sure you know the difference between the problem and the solution. What are you aiming at? What are you getting at? So let me walk through the examples we already had before, and I'll, I'll, I'll focus on each of these. I think what I'll do is start with problems three and four. I mean steps three and four, and then move to one and two afterwards. So uh, step three and four, problem and solution. Let me start with what we began with last time, which is the IKEA bookshelf. All right. So the first pr the question you can ask of any algorithm is what is it that it's trying to do? And here, it's trying to assemble the, the uh, Billy bookshelf. As a matter of fact, they even start, don't they, with pictures of the goal. Here's what you're trying to aim at. So in any program or any algorithm, it's really, really important to be clear on what is the goal, what is it that, that you're aiming at. Okay, the second, question, the second problem solving question to look at that we're, gonna, is, that we're gonna look at is number four in the list, and that's the solution. What will the actual procedure be? What will the algorithm be? This is where you actually have the algorithm itself. In other words, our goal is this. What are the steps to get there? It's these. Now what makes algorithms difficult is you're not just finding the solution, you're giving a procedure to find the solution. Um, that's much more difficult. So, for example, if I one, one of the things I used to use as an example in class was solving a Rubik's Cube. It's difficult to be able to solve the Rubik's Cube, but it's much more difficult to be able to give a solution that will solve the Rubik's Cube no matter, no matter what it starts from, right? I mean, one way is to solve it in one particular case. The other way is to, to give a set of steps that would always solve it no matter what you ended up with. It's a uh, it's one thing to find an answer to a problem. It's another thing to find the answer to how you find an answer. It's another thing to specify the procedure you could go through, which would always get you to the answer. So programs, algorithms, are all about the procedure that gets you to the answer. You're not just trying to answer the problem. You're trying to find out how one would ever answer the problem. And that's what make algor makes algorithms somewhat difficult. There's a lot of things that you know perfectly well how to do them, but it's hard to specify what you would do, how you do them in general. An example here is sorting several numbers. One of the things that we'll look at in... Um, in a couple of semesters, is it's a classical programming problem of how do you sort a whole bunch of numbers. If you have 100 uh, numbers in random order, how do you get them in order? Well, it's actually not too hard if I give you a list of numbers just as a human for you to put them in order. But suppose I said, I said, give me the instructions that I need to follow to put numbers in order without knowing how the, what the numbers are actually how the numbers are actually arranged to begin with. And so you have to you have to tell me a set of instructions that would help me if I follow them to inevitably get the numbers in order. That's trickier. So it's much more general. It's much more abstract um, than just simply finding a solution. It's finding a, a way to get to the solution. All right. So that, the first thing just to notice is. Question three is, what is your goal? In this case, it's assembling a shelf. What is your procedure? What's the algorithm? In this case, it's step one, you do this. Step two, you do that. Step two, three, you do this, and so on. But the other two questions I want to ask are about what I'm calling ingredients and primitive operations. Uh, primitive operations is actually used a lot in the theory. Ingredients is my own term. It comes from the idea of a recipe. But the idea is, every time you think about an algorithm, you, you have a couple things, a couple assumptions you're making. If you don't make any assumptions at all, then you would never be able to make the algorithm complete enough to be followable. You make certain assumptions about things you don't have to explain. So the first thing is you assume that there's certain things you have available. I'm calling these ingredients because if your algorithm was a recipe, the ingredients would be what you have available. But I don't really mean ingredients. I mean whatever it is you have available. So in the case of the IKEA bookshelf, it's pretty straightforward. You're assuming you have the parts to the bookshelf um, right here. 
If you don't have those parts, then none of the rest of the algorithm makes sense. So the algorithm assumes as you go through, when it says insert six of the wood plugs in the side panel holes with your thumb, it's assuming you have wood plugs, and it's assuming you have side panel holes. Otherwise, it would be unsolvable. And in the same way, every time you write an algorithm, there's certain things you assume. In the algorithm we looked at with making change, we assumed that there was a user there actually typing in the amount of change. If he's not there, the algorithm simply won't work. Certain programs depend on there being certain data in certain files, and if it's not there, the, the program just can't run. There's also another thing which you could also call, it's sort of like ingredients, but I would, uh, I, I would put it in the same category, what things do you have available, but it's a little more tricky. That is, there's some things that are not part of the specific case of this problem, but are just always there. Like here it says, insert six of the wood plugs in the side panel holes with your thumb. It not only assumes you have plugs in side panel holes, but that you have a thumb. In other words, it assumes you have a body and you can use it. This set of instructions would be no good at all for people who didn't have bodies. Obviously, that can't happen. But my point is, it assumes the physical world. and assumes. That. So again, if you look at a computer program, the computer program assumes there's actually a computer. It assumes you can store things, uh, store values, and you can actually calculate things and so on. But it assumes, more to the point, it assumes you've got a computer to work with. It assumes you've got people who are typing things in. It assumes all those different kinds of things. So every algorithm has certain things that it assumes are available for the algorithm. What do you have? What objects are you allowed to use according to the problem? And it sort of helps when you think about algorithms, algorithms to think about what kinds of objects you have. So this semester, this week, I mean, we're going to look at what kinds of algorithms we have in non-programming, what kinds of ingredients we have in non-programming situations. But uh, next week when we started a programming, one of the first things I'll settle is these are the things you have available. These are the things you can assume are there. And then these are the things that you don't have available and you'll have to either create for yourself or just do without. The second question is similar. It's not what kinds of things do you have available, but what kinds of abilities do you already have? Um, it assumes you can do things like push things in with your thumb in the IKEA bookshelf. What can you already do? What can be listed as a single step with no further explanation required? So if I'm here with IKEA, it doesn't, it says push these in, insert these with your thumb. It assumes that any normal human being knows how to insert things with his thumb. That's perfectly fine. You can tell these apart by just looking at the bottom of them as shown in the photo. It assumes that the person has the photo available or that they have the ability to see. I mean, if somebody couldn't see, this would be a totally unhelpful um, algorithm, right? So you're assuming the sense of vision and the, the ability to, to use your hands to do different kinds of things. Every different algorithm. If you were writing this algorithm for somebody who was blind, you'd have to write it differently. You couldn't say you can tell them apart by looking at the photo. <laughs> you'd have to say you can tell them apart and describe it in some other way that they could do by touch or, or in some, some other way or, or give them some way to distinguish. So every time you write an algorithm, I say you have to, precise, to specify precisely everything you need to know, but everything you need to know to, is relative to what you already know. If you already know how to do certain things, you don't have to tell those. In our program later on, we actually have an, uh, we add two numbers together. Well, we assume that you do not have to be told how to add two numbers together. If you didn't know how to add, we'd have to add a whole other portion of the algorithm to explain how to do addition. So every time you write a program, you need to know what kinds of things are already available. What kinds of things is the computer capable of doing without your explaining? And if the computer knows how to add, you can use add as a single step in your algorithm. Add the numbers. And they won't say how because they already know how. So every time you have an algorithm, you're asking, what is the problem? What is your solution? What kinds of things are you assuming you already have available? And what kinds of abilities are you assuming you already have available? Um, notice 2 tells you what kinds of things you can do. 4 tells you what kinds of things you're going to do and in what order. So just because I can add numbers doesn't mean that tells me when I should add them. That's why 2 and 4 are very different questions here. Let's look at the next example we had and identify the four things. All right, mastering the move and so on. What's the goal? The goal is to be able to dance the floss, or the, 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 the floss move, the floss dance. The, um, what is the solution? It's listed right here. Do all these different things. What kinds of things do they assume you have available? Not much here. They assume, again, you've got the pictures in the algorithm itself. They also assume that you are physically a, a, a person with a body and physically able to move around and and that you have uh, legs and arms and so on, and, and just all the normal stuff. But there's nothing really fancy here. And what kinds of things do you assume you can do? Well, things like keep your knees slightly bent. They don't, of course, give you an instruction for how to bend your knees. 
keep your hands in fists. They don't tell you, here's the instruction for putting your hands in fists. They don't say, to put your hand in a fist, you close the fingers and so that they're all bunched up together and then put the, the thumb over the top of them. Uh, maybe if this were for like a three-year-old, they'd have to do that, but mostly they assume you know how to do that. So uh, there's, and uh, so that would be an example there. Here's the recipes. What's the goal? There's the picture of the goal, angel food cake. What is the, what are the steps? The whole thing here is the recipe with the steps. And what are they assuming? Uh, they're assuming, first of all, that you have things like you have the ingredients, egg whites, cream of tartar, and so on. They're also assuming you have a stove and mixing bowls and, and things like that. And what kinds of things do they assume you already know how to do? Well, it says preheat oven. So they're assuming you have an oven, but they also assume you know how to preheat it. Whip white eggs with a pinch of salt until foamy. They assume you know how to whip the eggs, the egg whites. I mean, not white eggs, egg whites. And they assume you know the difference between foamy and non-foamy so that you can check that for yourself. Quickly fold in the flour mixture. They assume you know how to do that. Um, and uh, so you can see all the same elements there. Another example was the tax forms. What's the goal? To decide in this particular piece whether you have any dependents. And uh, what are the uh, things this, what are the, what's the solution? It's listed right here. What are the ingredients? Well, they assume you have other tax information. Sometimes they refer you to W-2 or, I mean, or, 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 and other kinds of things that you need to know. They assume you have a calculator if you need it or, or, the, or a pencil if you need it and pen and, and the form. They assume you already have a situation where you can tell if you have children, things like that. What kinds of abilities do they assume you have? Well, the ability to answer the questions they ask you here. Uh, is, is, is this child uh, is this child married? They assume you can answer that without further instructions. They don't have to give you an algorithm for deciding whether your child's married. They don't show it here, um, but often they make you do some calculations. They don't have to give you the instructions for adding numbers in the middle of the, of the IRS instructions because they assume you already have that as a basic operation, as a primitive operation. Uh, let's see. In our program itself, what do you? Uh, what's the problem? It's to it's to add two numbers together. What's the solution? Here it is. Uh, what kinds of ingredients do you have? Well, you assume there's a person who will enter the two numbers. You assume there's a computer, and you also identify i, j, and sum as parts of the program right away that you're sort of using like raw ingredients. These three things that are going to hold values. And then what can you do? Well, you can do things like plus. You can do things like assignment, that is taking a number and moving it into something else. You do things like input and output. Those are built in. You don't have to give an instruction to the computer. You don't have to write your program to say, here's how you're able to read the number for on the screen or on the keyboard. Here's how you're able to print things out on the screen. Here's the steps you take to produce a plot, to do an addition. Not because no, the computer knows how to do those, but because the chip knows how to do those. The computer does, but only because it's already been programmed into the chip. But as programmers, we're not doing that. That was done by engineers. So we have, as primitive operators, the ability to add, subtract, multiply, divide, the ability to move data around from one variable to another, the ability to get data from the keyboard, the ability to send data to the output device. And we, as, as programmers, we assume that there's a computer, we assume that there's a keyboard, we assume that there's a screen, we assume that there's a printer perhaps, we assume that there's a person out there entering stuff, whatever we need to assume about those. And the same kinds of things would happen with the flowcharts. I'm not going to go further into those. All right, so those are the four ingredients. I just want you to be thinking in terms of those things. What's the problem? What's your solution? Which is the actual algorithm itself? What are the ingredients? And what are the primitive operations? That is, what are we assuming is already there? This would be particularly helpful as we start the programming process next week. As we start looking at, here's what you need to give me as a program. Because people initially get confused because they're mixed up on what already they have available and what they don't. Um, and we'll talk more about that as we go. All right, your first assignment is based on this. So let me talk about the first assignment in a minute. Actually, let me do that in a separate video so it's easier for you to read just one or the other. This will be a video just about the four questions for problem solving. In the next video, I'm going to pick it up and we're going to talk about this for an example. And then we're going to, I'm going to talk about what the first assignment involves. Thanks.